happy November. Happy past November 1st. I know that's a that's one of our deadlines or one of your deadlines, one of our one of all of our deadlines. Um, so welcome. This is uh, our counselor coffee talk that we do every other Wednesday. So if you're new to this, this is just um, a support resource that we're offering school counselors. Um, party, we, we partner with a lot of schools and um, I can chat about how we do that. Um, my, uh, my partner in crime, my buddy, Matt Carpenter, he is going to be popping on. He had a little, um, his daughter had a little dental snafu, so he will be popping on. So um, at some point when he gets back to the office, but so I'm, uh, so you're kind of stuck with me at the beginning here. So maybe some of you um, were on last time when I talked about um, the CSS profile and did did a bunch of screenshots. Um, but really this, we don't have an agenda for today, like a presentation. So this is a time for you to ask questions. We're here to support you. Um, and so if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Happy to answer anything. If you have any questions, any follow-up questions about the CSS profile, you know, the, the deadlines, there's deadlines November 1st for some of the ED schools. And then we're going to have November 15th coming up next week um, will be another deadline. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the FAFSA. Um, little update there, we have not heard or the Department of Ed has still not announced when it's going live. Um, their, their line is just December 2023, which I'm sure most of you know. I'm a little surprised that we're now into November and we still don't have a firm date. Um, I'm thinking in my gut, it might go to January 1 for people that have been in this space for a while as I have that used to be the way it was it was always January 1 and it used to be you were providing information from the previous tax year so it was really crazy um the prior prior years made it a lot better for reporting but um that's why I'm thinking the further we get into November it actually might be a January 1 deadline but they haven't said so the minute we know, we will we will definitely blast that information out. Uh, I've got something. Oh, Anne Marie put in. Uh, oh, you just put it to me. Yeah, um, I can share a link with you if you have any questions about who, which schools, um, which schools. Require the CSS. So there, I'll put this link in the chat because she just put it to me. So I will put this in the chat. It's College Board's list. So it's a good starting point to know. There are, you know, I, I, I'm really big on if parents really or a student really wants deadline, the most accurate information, the college websites are the definite definitive source. But I just put the link in the chat and that will give you a list of uh, schools that require it for international, regular CSS, non-custodial CSS as well. So that's a that's a good starting point if if you're wondering, okay. What should be under third person counselor confirmation sample for non-custodial parent form? I mean, is there a sample? Can you elaborate? I'm not really sure what you're asking. I mean, is there a sample? A sample of the non-custodial CSS form? Is that what you're asking? Just go ahead and, and pop that in the Q&A and, and I can... Uh, I can try and respond. I'm not totally sure what you're asking. Um, so any any questions about FAFSA, CSS, anything around college funding? I'm here to uh, to address anything that that you're wondering. Wow, you guys are uh, you guys are uh, 
maybe it's a little too early for our, our West Coast people. Um, or maybe people are enjoying their lunch, hopefully, while they're watching me. Um, for those of you, how many could you just put in the um, could you put in the chat if you are um Oh, here's a question. Um, I was going to, and I'll address your question, Sarah. Um, could you put in the chat if you're new to Coffee Talk or if you're familiar with how we support schools, just give me a yes or no in the chat. That would be great because I can talk about how, how we can support you. Um, do you think more colleges will send estimated awards? Um, that, that could be, yes. I mean, the, so there's schools that require the CSS, as we all know, and then the FAFSA will come later. Um, so those schools can start, I mean, they can start working on it, right? The CSS shows up and they can look at it and start to get a feel for, you know, is this going to be a Pell eligible family? They can't award any of that. They got to wait to get the FAFSA before they're going to do an award. But I do think um, so I think those schools, the CSS schools, will definitely do that. Like for ED kids, if an ED student submits the CSS, which could have been November 1, or could be um, could be November 15th, um, then, sorry, Matt was texting me, so I, got, I thought he was telling me something. So I just, sorry, I got a little sidetracked. So if you've already submitted the CSS, they've already submitted for November 1 or November 15th, they can start thinking about their institutional awards. But but as I think most of you know, like they want to bring in the federal aid, if applicable for a family, because that'll meet part of the need. It doesn't come out of their endowment, potentially state aid. So And, and state aid comes off of the FAFSA. So that's going to be delayed as well. So I do think they'll try and do estimated awards. We've seen a few schools that are counseling parents submit the CSS profile and then go to the FAFSA estimator, do that and send that to us. And, and again, it wouldn't be an official award, but I think that might be part of why they're doing that so that they can give the family an idea of an award. I always tell families too, don't be shy about reaching out and asking, you know, for even before applying for a pre-read. So that's what's so hard about the DOE not, not giving a date because these colleges that only require the FAFSA, they're they're kind of stuck in this waiting mode. So, you know, these colleges are going to want to make sure that they're giving some information to these families. If they're admitting them um, and then giving merit aid, that can that comes out right away, right? They don't need to wait for the FAFSA um, to do that. So that piece could come in, but th they're going to really be scrambling if it does end up being January one. For the EA kids, usually EA kids, some of them would hear, as you as you all know, right? Some of them would hear toward the end of December. Well, that's I think that's pretty much not going to happen at all. Um, but even middle of January is going to be tough. So, but I I think they're gearing up and they're getting they know it's coming. It's just a matter of what that date is. So yes, I do think that they'll they'll do their best to send estimated awards and it'll say unofficial all over it. Just just because it's going to have to be, but they they want to bring students in, obviously. So they want to do their best to to um, to get them information as soon as possible. How do you see colleges handling five to nine funds? Do they divide by four? Oh, you okay? Divide by four to distribute it evenly over the course of the degree, or do they drain it up to the full? Okay, so that's a that's a good question. So about using 529 funds. And then I'll actually talk about 529 funds as it relates to the FAFSA changes as well, because there's been some talk that that might be changing of what they were saying. But what I tell families around 529s is you, in general, what families really should do in an ideal world is have a four year cash flow. Like look at the school over four years and have the cost. And this is some of the work that. I've dealt with families for years where they have the cost every year and ideally it should be inflated a little bit, the cost of attendance, right? Because it's going up every year. And then look at what the college gives, you know, 
merit money, need base, whatever it happens to be, and then what their budget is. And that's going to include them, the family's budget. That's going to include the five two nines. They don't want to just use up the maximum five two nine and say no to, for example, direct student loans or work study because, oh, we don't need that. We have five two nine to cover because what can happen with families is all of a sudden it's junior year and they do a big gulp and say, uh oh, what do we do? We've and I've had this exact thing happen where people reach out that haven't worked with us and then they say, OK, could you help? Because I have no more five two nine. Um, and the direct student loans will come in every year, but they're use it or lose it. So they can't go back to freshman year and sophomore year, for example, the 5,500 and 6,500 and say, hey, I want to I want to have that now because I don't have any more 529 funds. So I really tell families, plan that out because most families don't have enough in a 529 to cover all four years, especially at these expensive private schools. So I tell them, you've got to be strategic and plan this out over four years, because if you're going to run out junior year, then you're and, and loans are going to be part of the strategy. They're going to want to take some that the most families, those direct federal loans in the name of the student are the best place to start for loans for most families. But as I said, it's use it or lose it. So take that 5,500, take that 6,500 sophomore year, and then you'll have your 529 will last longer. You might still run out senior year, but then you're not looking at plus loans or private loans at a much higher interest rate. So that's that's my guidance around that, that they really should look at things that way and see the delta for each year. Because when I'm working with families routinely, I'm like, you, you know, and, and plus, if they're given subsidized federal direct loans, that's a no brainer because there's no interest until six months after the student graduates. So that's free money on the government can be paid back at any point after graduation up to six months. And it's just the principal. So if they're eligible for that, they definitely should be taking that. Um, and then planning on if they can afford it, plan on paying it off the day after you graduate. And it's, it, it was, you know, you took the float on that money. So so that's my answer to that great question that gets into my, I'm a financial planner by background. So I love those kind of questions. Um, okay. Can you explain the difference of EFC and SAI and the potential impact of this change? Sure. So basically student aid index, the terminology has replaced the terminology of expected family contribution. So for parents or students, definitely a terminology change. Cost of attendance minus SAI is going to give you your need, just like EFC. But there are some pretty major changes in the background. And the, the biggest changes that affect most families, I can, I can go over those. The first one is with the SAI, if the student if the, I mean, if the family has crossover years, meaning they have more than one student in school at once. So I have twins. So I was always in that boat, right? But a lot of families will have a senior right now and a junior. So they're going to have three crossover years in that cash flow, right? I always tell those type of families, you've got a five-year cash flow. You've got one year with your oldest, three years with two kids, and one year with your youngest, because that can dramatically change the aid. But what the, the new legislation has said is, for federal aid, we are not taking that into account. So old school, you had a 70,000 EFC, second child enters school, it will go down, not perfectly 50%, but pretty close to 50%. So that could be, that was huge for families because no need at 70,000, but now that it's down to like say 38,000 at a school that costs 50 or 60. Now we have need for those three years. So they could plan for that and then get endowment money that maybe they weren't getting the first year when there was no crossover. So that's being eliminated. But I will tell you, because I was on all the Department of Ed webinars about this over the summer, they did make a point. The government said colleges can still take that into account for their institutional aid. So that means their free money that they're giving. 
So th that was huge. I mean, I paused it. I actually quoted her. She gave an example of how they could do this. So realize federal money, Pell Grant, FSCOG, subsidized student loans, work study, the, the EFC or the SAI will not be reduced when you have more than one in school. But the college can exercise professional judgment. That's the industry jargon for this and actually update that SAI to give out their institutional money. And there is a question on the new FAFSA that says how many kids are in college. So they will know if it's triple, it's, it's three or it's two. The colleges will see that. And I also see that as a great opportunity for families to appeal, to say, you know, I know you can do this. And these are the reasons that we're asking you to do this because it doesn't make a lot of sense that a family that has a certain income and certain amount of assets can magically pay double. It just makes no sense at all. But I was happy to hear that, that they're, they're saying for federal, you got to follow our rules. But when it comes to your money, you don't you can follow our rules, but you don't have to. So that's a big change. Another change is for divorced and separated families. So only one parent submits the FAFSA, only the custodial parent. And so the old definition was where the child spent the most time, like slept the most nights, literally. That's different now. So the definition for custodial parent for the CSS as well as the FAFSA is the parent that provides the most financial support. And, and, and it's from a year look back from when you hit submit on that form. So it's not 2022, it's not a calendar year or a tax year. It's literally a year look back from submitting. So that gives families wiggle room. There, there's some gray area there, right? There's some ability to strategize while still being honest on the forms. And so what we've told families is, you know, think of it. Hey, Matt. Um, what we've told families is, you know, think about this. If you truly are 50-50, meaning you provide the same amount of support for your child, we'll figure out who's better to be the custodial parent and have that parent spend $50, $100 more on soccer, whatever it is. Um, and that could mean thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of aid potentially. So, you you know, of course, we always want to counsel parents, you need to be honest, right? But there is some gray area there. In my mind, if if they're amicable, they can do that. And there's a lot of families that do say that they are 50-50 when it comes to that. That's another big change. Another one is business owners. If you're if if you have families that they're business owners, small business with less than 100 full time employees, the value of that business used to be off the table. There was an exclusion that doesn't exist anymore. And so now there's a whole bunch of thinking around, well, how do I value my business? And some people have a true value, but a lot of consultants business I used to have, if I got hit by a bus, I don't think, you know, my, my business was not it didn't have a big value that I would have put on there. And so a lot of consultants might put zero, some people not, but that's an area where parents are probably going to need some guidance because I think they're going to tend to overestimate their business because they're going to feel like they have to put something down and it needs to be substantial, which is not necessarily the case. So those are the biggest changes. I mean, I could go on. There's there's other stuff. Oh, and the person who asked about the 529 about using it all up right away. That this ties into your question with 529s. The, the, the Department of Ed originally came out and said, only include the 529 value for the student that is submitting the FAFSA. So that was a change because it used to be all 529s. Now there's been some murmuring and a second draft that says they're backtracking on that. But um, at CAP, we're just waiting to see what officially comes out. That's what they officially said at the beginning, but they might they might be changing their tune. You know, there's information all over the internet, but we're going to wait till we hear it from the horse's mouth. So hopefully that helps with like the biggest changes that are coming down. Um, and parents will have no idea. They'll just know there's a terminology change. So um, hopefully that was helpful and not too much information. And Peggy, I know if you want to skedaddle, buddy, thanks for covering 
Sure. Inter interesting sure. morning. Interesting morning in the car. I, know, I told him you had a little Under, dental stuff. I was right told. But, uh, yes. Um, so the, or my, my little one did, my little buddy did. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, yeah. but we're okay. Everybody's okay. Uh, but we're just scrambling a little bit today. But, um, yeah, and I asked check me people at the beginning, or, or Matt, just, just real quick. I asked people at the beginning if they were new. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, but several just so you know when you're when you're talking about how we can support them they're they're new or some are familiar so anyways got it okay i appreciate you stepping up uh okay well i'm gonna you are you are in very capable hands i will uh i will hop out here so happy thanksgiving everybody i know it's a little early but all right take care thank you again peggy had to bounce out um and she kicked everybody out by accident. So I'll just give uh, give everybody just a second. And, and I think it was Joan O'Hare that posted a question, um, which I'm happy to answer. I saw it, but then there was another question I don't believe I saw. So if if if, if you did post a question and didn't get answered, please please um, please repost it. So. Uh, just real quick, I'm Matt Carpenter. Thanks for your patience today. Generally speaking, I'm I'm seeing the this event. For those of you that are new, my uh, soon to be nine year old daughter had a tooth come out with the brace still on it. My wife wasn't around, so they, uh, you know, I had to. I may get dad of the year. I may get dad of the year at this rate. Um, but apologies to you all that. That doesn't matter to, uh, to none of your concerns. So luckily I had a good teammate. Peggy, you kicked us all out, buddy. What's your problem? What's your problem? I was just doing it quickly and I hit the wrong button. I'm so sorry. I have done it more than once, but it looks like we got at least most people back with us, but it's all good, pal. Don't all right. So it. if I had leave, I'm good to go. I won't screw leave, you. Leave, I might have to say the assign and leave. I think since I started all right, it, we're all well, since you started it, you, yeah, you're the host oh, now. You should be good. Just leave. These these new folks are thinking we don't have our act together here, pal. But ho hopefully they come back and we can prove well, We got that. 12 people came back and they, we got a bunch. Yeah, I'm sure. Sorry. I'm really sorry. Good, pal. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. We're all good. Um, And you can leave, buddy, for real. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I, if I needed to start up again, I didn't mess you up. Okay. Um, okay, so there we are. We did it right this time. So a uh, good question here in terms of how does somebody with a low income that has a lot of home equity impact financial aid offers? Does it impact financial aid offers? Specifically federal versus institutional schools, right? And again, for those of you that don't know, our platform, we equate it to being like the Naviance or SCORE or school links, whatever you use in your school on the admission side, specifically for financial aid and scholarships. And it does a lot of things, but one of them is a really robust net price calculator. And we're a lot more accurate than the college's net price calculators. One of the reasons being that there's not one college, you may be surprised to hear this, you know this if you follow us a lot, but there's not one college in the country that has their own net price calculator. They all outsource them to third parties. The accuracies, the accuracy of these are not regulated uh, some of them are from 2008, the first year they were introduced, because there's no rule that says you have to update your net price calculator. So uh, kind of a wild, wild west out there. But anyways, I think Amherst, uh, this is a great example. So this is a family, lower-ish income, meaningful amount of home equity, okay, this example. And here's three schools, institutional methodology schools that all require the CSS profile, okay, all almost identical sticker prices, but we're paying a different amount at each of these schools. Why? Okay. And this is all baked into the algorithm, but a school like NYU, well, number one, they don't meet 100% of need, although they're claiming they're going to this year. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Um, but if you have home equity, they look at all of it. Okay. Basically, in, in Boston College is another example, tons of the institutional methodology schools. If you have home equity, they consider just about... All of it's a little extreme, but most of it, they're looking at the same way they're looking at any money you have in a, in a savings account, 529 mutual fund, whatever, right? Amherst College, yes, they're an institutional methodology school. Yes, they require the CSS profile. They don't factor home equity into the equation at all. 
And then you have a school like BU that's somewhere in between. A lot of these colleges have kind of a, yes, we look at home equity, but we don't look at all of it. How much we look at is an index tied to your income. So if you have a high income, we're going to look at more of your home equity. Lower income, we're going to look at less. Um, <clears throat> and it's usually capped. So telling you more than you need to know, again, you just got to kind of trust the technology, trust the platform here. But all of that is school specific and baked into the platform. For, for, so for any school you put in here, if you have home equity, we're going to tell you how much or if at all, that's going to factor into the um, into your your award eligibility or financial aid eligibility, right? If I look at a UMass Amherst, for example, right, all schools, and so I can click into any college, right, and we're seeing why we're getting a discount in this case, really smart kid, Massachusetts resident, we're going to get a merit-based scholarship, okay? Uh, and, and for every college in the country, we have every scholarship that the college offers the qualifications for each and how likely is it that that you're going to get some and then why 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 do we think we're going to get or why are we projecting you to get 3000 at UMass uh, and we can again there's some context here well here's the average GPA here's the average test scores and and usually a good um uh, it makes sense for why we're projecting how much you got out of college assuming that we did now, the other thing that I want to point to here is it pertains to home equity. Under this financial aid tab, we're telling you what type of basically business model that the college uses. If it's a federal methodology school, we know for certain they do not factor home equity into the um, process at all. They are FAFSA only school in most cases, but anyway, it, but they're not looking at home equity. So this kind of financial aid SAI basis or, or methodology is another hint in terms of helping you figure out how much, if at all, our college is going to look at home equity. And uh, by the way, if, it, if anybody is curious, I'm not sure if Peg, let me just go grab my meeting link. Um, but if, if anybody wants to learn more about how we typically um, partner with schools, I'm, I'm just grabbing my... Um, link here you you can book a time with me and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through obviously the platform to see if if um you know you think it would be something that would be of value for your um uh, for for families at school for your school counseling office right we partner with if i'm not sure if peg said it's a top or not but uh hundreds of schools across the country um and that number is actually growing i guess you could say thousands at this point okay um, but yeah, I just put my link in the chat there so you can grab a time with me. I can learn about more about your school and share specifics on how we support um, school counselors and, and families in their schools and districts. Okay, next question here. Okay. Okay, so this is a, a, a question about if you are... Yeah, this is always a tricky one where you have these families that are, um, it's a college that requires the CSS profile from both households, okay? And obviously the big caveat or the, the um, it gets really hard when it's, it's uh, a tricky situation where one household, right, is we don't know where they are. They're incarcerated. They're just unwilling to cooperate it's really contentious maybe there's some legal uh, um, things that are happening or have happened etc and the long and the short of it is we're not going to be able to get that that person's information from that uncooperative parent okay and what happens there and it's school specific for these colleges that are requiring that information it's not a huge number but it tends to be some pretty popular ones we have to apply what's for, apply for what's called a non-custodial waiver, and every college is a little bit different. But the general template is that they want the parent to share their story, tell us what's going on, give us the gory details. It's not a you really got to air your dirty laundry. It's not a pleasant process. They want to know the same thing from the student, and oftentimes the same thing from a third party. And in some cases, they're looking at you all as school counselors, and they want you to provide kind of um, to the extent that you know if you do verify what the parent and student has provided. Um, and 
And so that is, um, sorry if I just cut out for a second here, but yeah, they are, they are ultimately looking at you as school counselors to verify um, what the, the parent and uh, student has shared in terms of, um, you know, what's going on in their household and why they cannot get this uh, other parent to complete the um, the profile, right? The profile that they're available for. So I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think it, for you all as school counselors, right, uh, uh, they're just looking for you to kind of be a witness for lack of a better word and say, yeah, to the extent that uh, that I know um, what the parent and student are saying here about this other parent and why they can't get this information is true. Uh, if you're comfortable, right? I know it's 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 that's not a comfortable position to be in. Uh, I certainly understand. Um, okay, I'm just seeing if there's any other questions here. Yeah, let me um, let me know if there's any other questions. Otherwise, I'm gonna um, I will dismiss class early today since we've had a couple curveballs, such as life. Um, but let me hang out for a couple more minutes and make sure I get to any other questions. Yeah, can you please? I I don't think that I saw the question about undocumented students receiving aid. If 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 you could post that again, um, I'll 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 talk to that uh, for a minute here. The, the long and the short is there's really no silver bullet here. You know, I, this is probably the question we get the most from school counselors. How do I help? these undocumented students and families. Um, and I wish we had an answer that is uh, simpler and and kind of a, a one resource we could point you to. And just, I wish we had information that you guys probably don't already. And I don't think that we do. Um, how we coach this is really that it's, it's uh, here's a few things that we know overall. We know we can't apply for federal aid. Right. We can't complete the FAFSA if we are not documented, if we are not a citizen of the United States. Um, we can't complete the FAFSA. We're not going to be eligible for federal aid. There are some states that um, are better than others. Texas and California does a pretty good job with this, where you can complete kind of a state version of the FAFSA that can potentially provide at least some state resources if these students go to school in state. So some states have some state resources. Um, but again, they're in the minority and they're still working out the kinks as these are relatively new programs as this becomes a uh, wider spread challenge. Um, so what I focus, what I have families focus on is to get to know the colleges that you are targeting, applying to, et cetera. Right. And it tends to be that private colleges that have their own institutional money as a whole. And of course, I'm generalizing here. There's more resources there for these undocumented students. Um, so so usually based on the type of student they are, where they are in the country, types of schools they like, you know, I'd say, hey, they like probably would be a better fit at smaller private colleges close to home. Reach out to them specifically to say, hey, we're undocumented, or I have an undocumented student. What, if any, resources do you offer families that fit into this bucket? So it, it it becomes a very manual process, right? We can start at the state level, see if we have any options there, and then it's about targeting specific colleges to see, okay, what resources can you offer? If we were to get accepted, you know, what might we expect from a merit and or need-based standpoint or neither? Right. There's some colleges that you're not going to get any money if you're not documented, um, you know, even merit. So. Um, so, again, I wish I had a simpler, better, more robust answer, but that's kind of the hard reality. Um, that, and, and the best way that we know how to coach it at the moment, I mean, we're trying to get better and better and get more resources here, but that's we're working within the reality of the system as a whole. OK. Yeah, so I, you know, if family if a family has forty five k or whatever, let's just say a hundred k in a five twenty nine, do colleges expect that families contribute all that in year one, or is there a percentage of five twenty nine that college colleges don't differentiate between a five? There are some complexities, but 
on the whole, whatever you put, you have in 529s, mutual funds, savings account, checking account, CDs, stocks, bonds, et cetera, they don't differentiate, again, are there exceptions and do schools like to take a closer look sometimes? Yes, but that's why we don't want to itemize how our assets and investments are. But according to the formula, most of them follow this you know, fairly well, they don't see a difference between a 529, a, a mutual fund savings account, et cetera. And again, on the whole, they're expecting about 5 to 6% of that. Again, not a perfect number. gets used for college each year. So even if you have $100,000 in a 529, that's going to increase the amount you'd be expected to pay, increase your SAI by call it, you know, um, $6,000, five to $6,000. And it's a year by year basis. So they're not chopping it up over four years or anything like that. They're looking at your snapshot right now and plugging that into their formula to dictate how much they think you should pay. I appreciate the kind words for for my little lady, Emma Claire. Nine years old. And shoot, less than a month now, man. December second. Imagine that. Um, but thank you. I appreciate that. And I will indeed. Much as I love you guys, you know, I can't take precedent over over the roof over your head, right? All right. Um if that's all the questions, again, we'll kind of cut class early. I appreciate you showing up. For those of you that are brand new to us, please, uh, it's usually a little less choppy than it was today. Um, and uh, oftentimes, we'll kind of speak specifically on particular subject matter, uh, usually about once a month, and then interchanging with that, just kind of this open grab bag. Um The other thing is we love getting uh, hearing from you all to say, please talk about this. Right. We love uh, a lot of when we do these coffee talks and we have a specific subject matter, oftentimes it's it's driven by what you all want to hear about. Um, you know, what questions are you getting that are tripping you up or, um, you know, so uh, please let us know again if you want to talk further or book a time with me. We have a dedicated email address just for you guys. Right. Counselor at collegeaidpro.com. That's your bat line. Any questions at all, send them there. We have eyes on it. We get back very in a very timely way. Uh, if we don't have the answer, we usually know where to go to get it. So any questions, just make, you know, make us an extension of your office. That's, that's our goal here. Um, all right, y'all, it looks like we're done with questions. And uh, with that, uh, we will get back to our days. Thank you again for your patience and bearing with me today. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.